When you're smiling. Hey, you. Bubbly sparkling water is crisp, refreshing, and perfect for any occasion. Kind of like my voice, but in a can. No calories, no sweeteners, all smiles. Bubbly. Crack a smile. This episode is brought to you by HP. When you're working apart from your team, feeling connected can be a challenge. Presenting HP Presence, a more thoughtful, human collaboration technology. With enhanced audio and video features, you can experience more genuine collaboration and feel more connected. Be in the room, from any room, with HP Presence. Learn more at hp.com forward slash presence. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 84, Master of My Fortunes. Now that Lord Randolph was gone, Jenny and Winston were left to recompose their relationship. And the lady may have found Winnie the boy an annoyance, but now that he was just short of turning 21, she felt she understood the young man before her. In short, their relationship morphed into that of a partnership. Quote, My mother was always at hand to help and advise, but I was now in my 21st year, and she never sought to exercise parental control. Indeed, she soon became an ardent ally, furthering my plans and guarding my interests with all her influence and boundless energy. Unquote. And as his partner she made her first move. She contacted the Duke of Cambridge, who could make things happen within the armed forces, and within two weeks, Winston received his orders. On February 18, 1895, Winston reported to the 4th Hussars, and two days later was awarded his commission. It read, Victoria, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, Queen, Defender of the Faith, Empress of India, and to our trusty and well-beloved Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, gentlemen, greeting, we reposing a special trust and confidence in your loyalty, courage, and good conduct do by these presents constitute and appoint you to be an officer in our land forces from the 20th day of February, 1895. You are therefore carefully and diligently to discharge your duty as such in the rank of second lieutenant. Excitement must have filled the young man, but there were hard times ahead for him. Winston would spend the next six months with enlisted recruits under the tutelage of a semi-sadistic riding master called Jocko. The recruits rather enjoyed watching their young superior belittled by Jocko, who never missed an opportunity. And Winston certainly delivered them up. Soon after arriving, Churchill pulled a thigh muscle, which prevented him from properly gripping his horse. Hence, he fell off several times. Within seconds, Jocko was there, shouting at the young man, questioning his competence to be in his current position. Later, Winston wrote of this, quote, Many a time did I pick myself up, shaken and sore, and dawn again, my little gold-braided pork pie cap, fastened on the chin by a bootlace strap, with what appearance of dignity I could command. Unquote. But it wasn't long before his writing skills became apparent and his elders were impressed. It was this talent or some other element that allowed his training to be cut from six to three months, because then older officers invited him to participate in their annual steeplechasing contest. All of the women in Winston's life warned him to stay away from this activity due to the danger involved. But Winston distinguished himself by coming in third. However, as far as cutting his life short or ruining his career before it could even get started, the jumping of high fences was just a warm-up for what was to come. Another Sandhurst graduate, Alan Bruce, was about to join the 4th Hussars. But his unpopularity accompanied him from the military academy, and it was quickly decided by some of Winston's older comrades that Bruce was not welcome. 
Being gentlemen, they took the newly arrived Alan to dinner at the Nimrod Club in London and gave the young man a flimsy excuse as to why he had to leave. Bruce knew theirs was a cock and bull story and remained. Not having taken the hint, the officers then made accusations against Bruce of foul language, familiarity with enlisted men, and abusing regimental sergeants. He was then asked formally to resign. Nothing doing, Allen's enraged father, A.C. Bruce Price, persuaded the weekly review Truth to write up the story about a subaltern who was asked to leave even before it was his time to report in. But there was more. Then the father, using Winston's rather dark reputation from Harrow, accused the young man of, quote, acts of gross immorality of the Oscar Wilde type, unquote. This career-ruining accusation could not be borne. Winston immediately hired the lawyers from Lewis and Lewis, who issued a writ demanding 20,000 pounds. The father, realizing he had gone too far, was able to get Winston to settle for 500 pounds, an apology and a complete retraction. Quote, I unreservedly withdraw all and every imputation against your character complained of by you in paragraph two of your statement of claim, and I hereby express my regret for having said the same. Unquote. The paper tried to keep the story going, but it was over as far as Churchill needed to fear, the accusation of homosexuality. Ironically, the former troubled schoolboy was now accepted into the regiment as a martyr. Now that the scare to his reputation was over, Winston could go back to his life as a subaltern within the 4th Hussars, not that there was much to focus on. He, like the others around him, was required to spend two hours a day riding, something he would have gladly done on his own. Another hour in the stables, tending to the horses, again, more a pleasure than a chore, and an hour and a half drilling, the real work of the day. After that, and before, Winston's time was his own. And as such, he started his day with his Batman bringing him breakfast while still in bed. If there was any daylight left after completing his duties, Winston spent time playing games against his comrades. But, like most combative men who only liked to play games they were good at, he stayed away from golf. Quote, a curious sport whose object is to put a very small ball in a very small hole with implements ill-designed for the purpose. Unquote. But most of his afternoons were consumed with polo or steeplechasing. He became proficient at both. Of course, the latter was the more dangerous of the two. Not that Winston, like most young men, who feel the need to test their bodies, seemed to notice. Still, he occasionally fell during a jump and ended up in bed for a few days. Winston was to see more than his fair share of important people when they visited the military town Aldershot, as it was no more than 30-odd miles from London. The Hussars would maneuver and salute whichever celebrity, royal or otherwise, wanted to receive them. A youngish cavalryman, Captain Douglas Haig, watched them drill one afternoon. And when distinguished guests of royalty or within the government showed up, Winston, as the son of a duke, which meant more than his rank ever could, was chosen to escort them around. His best moment came when he got to spend time with the Prince of Wales. Don't let the irony escape you here. The Duke of Cambridge, the Duke of Connaught, Field Marshal Lord Roberts, and the Duke and Duchess of York, the future King George V and Queen Mary. But even this day was eclipsed when Queen Victoria herself, in her carriage, positioned herself at the saluting point, and the entire Aldershot garrison, about 25,000 strong, passed before her. But despite all this practiced precision, not one of them ever expected to set foot on the continent in a war footing. Battles were to be fought and won, or die in the attempt, in subduing uncivilized peoples, while defending or adding on to the empire. The bravery or elan was certainly there, but no one imagined putting that zest for war to the test against any power in Europe. 
And as major battles were not expected, the men of the 4th Hussars and others spent their nights attending this or that ball. Winston certainly received, quote, a great many invitations and could go to a ball every night should I wish to, unquote. He wished to, and why not? Every occasion was stuffed with all the right people, members of parliament, the cabinet, people of class, distinction, or of the right birth, and many were related to each other. Again, Winston's rank as the son of a duke opened doors that his military rank never could. But during this gay time, there were soon burdens to carry. As every child experiences, as they grow into their own, those who have come before them enter their last years. And it was Winston's time to face this stage of life. His father had died in January. His grandmother, Clara, from his mother's side, died that April. And the summer brought the most unwelcome news that womb, Mrs. Everest, was seriously ill. His former nanny had written him on the 1st of April from her sister's house at 15 Crouch Hill in the Islington district of North London. Quote, My darling precious boy, I have just received two pounds ten shillings. I thank you very much indeed, dearest. It is awfully kind and thoughtful of you. My dear, dear boy, you are one in ten thousand. Unquote. Womb's sister then wrote to Winston in late June that his lady was getting worse. He rushed to her side through the rain. But when he got there, all she cared about was getting him out of his soaked clothes before he got sick. He couldn't stay the night because of a parade the next day, but rushed back when he was told Womb was near the end. The scared young man gathered up Dr. Keith, a nurse, and rushed to her bedside. She smiled at him as he came into the room, but then lapsed into a coma. He held her hand until she passed away at 2.15 the next morning. He later wrote of her, quote, Death came very easily to her. She had lived such an innocent and loving life of service to others and held such a simple faith. She had no fears at all and did not seem to mind very much. Unquote. The grief-stricken boy, for that's what he was at this moment, arranged her funeral. She was buried in Manor Park Cemetery. Jenny was in Paris at the time and declined Winston's invitation to come. But many people were there. At first, this shocked Winston. But then he realized that she must have touched many people in her long life of giving and care. Quote, All her relations were there a good many of whom have traveled from Ventnor overnight, unquote. Winston paid for the headstone that read, Erected in memory of Elizabeth Ann Everest, who died 3rd July, 1895, aged 62, by Winston Spencer Churchill, Jack Spencer Churchill. He also paid a local florist to keep the grave tidy and then let the complete feeling of loss invade him. In this state, he went to his father's grave in Bladen and remarked to his mother, who had not yet visited the grave, how quiet and peaceful the place seemed to be. Here was Winston's last break with his past. His only moments of happiness were with womb, and she was now gone. Still, that pain and dealing with the disappointment of his absent parents readied in a sad way this young man for a larger world. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Lloyd, host of Historical Blindness, the podcast about historical mysteries, myths, and frauds. With so many working from home these days, we become our own taskmasters, making ourselves feel guilty about taking any time to have a bit of fun when we think we should be doing something productive. The truth is that self-care increases productivity. And taking a little break here and there to enjoy yourself can make you more focused when you return to the tasks you've set yourself. Good thing the puzzle adventure game Best Fiends is always within reach so that you can reward yourself with some hard-earned fun. I find time to play between tasks as a palate cleanser when I need to shift gears. I'm only on level 143, but there's always so much new content, new characters, and new seasonal events 
there's an endless supply of fun to inject into my day. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. The Army, in its current mold, would be with Winston forever. And it was a peculiar institution, rife with traditions and customs. And if one had to ask how or why something was done a certain way, well, they obviously didn't belong there in the first place. Most of the officers of the 4th Hussars, and this was true of most officers in the British Army, were conservative in outlook, which pleased Winston very much. It was as if change no longer was an option after Waterloo. And Wellington's sentiments that English gentlemen made the best officers in the world still held, still dominated. Of course, what this tone, a Victorian word connotating class, came down to was family. You had to be of the right sort, with the right parents and the correct worldview. Men got in, not because of military qualifications, but because an applicant was, quote, the son of a good soldier, unquote, or, quote, his mother is a lady, unquote, or, quote, a good man to hounds, unquote. Telling if someone was the right sort could be done after a few minutes of conversation. If they had a classical education, the phrase, by Jove, would emerge. Other ranks, and that's with a capital O and capital R, did not exclaim in this way. Traditions and customs dominated everything in this rarefied world, including all acts towards each other. Gambling debts to other gentlemen had to be promptly paid, but bills to others, like tradesmen, were not. The tradesmen who made Winston's first uniform for the 4th Hussars had still not been paid six years later. Enlisted men were called Tommy Atkins, or Tommies, simply because the Iron Duke Wellington had picked it as a sample name for an army ID card. Officers drank wine, brandy, or whiskey. Other ranks drank gin or beer. Why? Because that's the way it had always been. And a meal was much more than just about food. It had its own purpose and process. Proper mess jackets had to be worn. New subalterns did not speak until spoken to. The first toast of the night went, of course, to the queen, and then the port was passed from right to left. Again, as it had always been. And this one is my favorite. No one was allowed to smoke until the decanter had circled the room twice. Again, sounds frivolous, but it was tradition, and it helped those included hold on to the world that they ruled. Talking during mess was never about the job. It simply wasn't done. Instead, the discussions evolved around women, religion, and politics. Sports were also acceptable, so there was much bragging about shooting rabbits, quail, stags, grouse, ducks, snipes, pigeons, and whatever else had the great misfortune to step in front of their guns. In summation, theirs was a world of its own. Compared to the armies across the Channel, the size of the British forces was not much of a threat. But again, these men never pictured opposing continental forces. When Bismarck was asked what he would do if the British army landed in Prussia, he remarked, quote, send a policeman and have it arrested. Unquote. Entertaining, yes, but it demonstrated the enormous differences between the two. The British had no corps, divisions, or even brigades. It was all about the regiment. And that included the makeup of the infantry as well. An infantry regiment could be a single battalion of 700 men, separated into five or so companies. An entire cavalry regiment, like the 4th Winston belonged to, whether comprised of hussars, dragoons, or lancers, could number from 300 to 500 men, its officers being comprised thusly, a colonel, four majors, eight captains, and about 15 subalterns. 
And all told, there were just 31 cavalry regiments in the whole British Army. And of course, these positions paid very little. A gentleman was expected to have his own income to live off of. Yet, their bravery could not be questioned, and this was expected of those rising in the ranks. After all, those who had come before them had helped forge a world empire. The elders taught the younger men that it was disgraceful to bob or duck bullets and shells. Officers leading a column didn't carry a weapon, but rather a swagger stick, or, if really calm and collected, a cigar. For example, at the Battle of Isandawana, every officer had a horse and could have escaped when the battle turned against them. But they did not. They stayed and died with their men. The fourth hussars were told of their eventual destination of India, but were given ten weeks leave first. Winston was bored and decided to take advantage of another peculiar tradition. Sometimes officers would go on leave and fight in another country's war. This had happened so many times over the years that no one raised an eyebrow when Winston decided to spend part of his leave seeing war firsthand in Cuba as the Spanish were trying to crush a rebellion there. The rebels fighting for independence were being led by José Martí and Máximo Gómez. But young Churchill's motivation was not as simple as it sounds. He did desire to see war up close to test his bravery, but he would have to travel through the United States, and he could satisfy his curiosity about his mother's country. And again, he was so bored. But there was one more reason, and who's to say how important it was when stacked up against the others. His debts, from attending balls to covering expenses from being a cavalry officer, were mounting, and Jenny was quickly getting aggravated at his constant pleas for assistance. Before taking a ship west, Winston had contacted the Daily Graphic, the paper that had printed his father's letters from Africa, and got them to agree to pay him five guineas for every dispatch from the front of the Cuban Rebellion. With this set, he talked the regiment's senior subaltern, Reginald Barnes, to travel with him. He also checked his plans with Braverson, his commander, who had no problems with this, nor did his mother, but it's unclear if he asked her or just explained his plans of going. Regardless, she sent him 90 pounds and wrote back, quote, I understand all right, and of course, darling, it is natural that you should want to travel, and I won't throw cold water on your little plans, unquote. This is war we are talking about, right? Winston then wrote to the British ambassador in Spain, Henry Wolfe, who more than agreed to his plans. At the time, the Spanish were suffering from a public relations black eye in sending 200,000 men to subdue Cuba's struggle for freedom. And the British and American newspapers were clearly on the rebel side. A few articles from a prominent British soldier could only help the Spanish with their reputation, as the rebels were killing civilians and burning towns. The Spanish troops were doing that too, but perhaps this could be left out. So, on November 2nd, the year of Lord Randolph's death, 1895, Winston and Barnes boarded the Cunard Royal Mail steamship Etruria and headed for the United States. Ironically, the future First Lord of the Admiralty found the trip, quote, tedious and uncomfortable, and I shall always look upon journeys by sea as necessary evils, unquote. But all the discomfort was forgiven and forgotten when they fell into the hands of Burke Cochran, a rich Irish-American congressman, lawyer, and integral part of Tammany Hall political machine, and the New York scene. He was everything a young man could want to be, rich, influential, worldly, a fantastic speaker, and utterly charming. And as such, he had uh, spent time with Jenny years ago. She had written to him to take care of her son. This he did, and more. First, he put them in his large apartment at 763 Fifth Avenue on the corner of 58th Street. 
And in no time, the two British officers found themselves with, quote, engagements for the next few days about three deep, unquote. For example, at their first dinner, they met 12 judges, which included a Supreme Court justice. At first, Churchill and Barnes had planned on staying only three days. But with a host like this and having New York opened to them, they stayed for a week. They attended the annual horse show, drove to five fires with the fire commissioner, the only way to attend a fire, and met the Cornelius Vanderbilts. Winston then visited West Point, but found the discipline there beyond strict or, quote, positively disgraceful, unquote. It probably reminded him of the many negative moments he had at his various schools. But overall, America captured his heart. Quote, what an extraordinary people the Americans are. Their hospitality is a revelation to me, and they make you feel at home and at ease in a way that I have never before experienced. Unquote. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale, reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash World War II, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash world war two right now. Shopify.com slash world war two. Their daily activities were exciting and varied, but many of their nights ended the same way. Barnes would retire for the night, which left Winston and Cochrane hours yet to talk well into the night on topics that ranged from economics to yacht racing. Here was an older man that did not see Winston simply as his father's disappointing son. Winston was taken for a man on his own and of his own. Cochran, on their first night they were alone, gave Winston his first cigar, and they relaxed while sipping brandy. But there was a war to get to, so the two young officers boarded a train, and 36 hours later they climbed aboard the steamer Olivet in Tampa, Florida. And by November 20th, they were within sight of Havana. It was here that Winston posted his first writing as a war correspondent. High up on the cliffs, as the ship enters the Narrows, one sees the fortress of El Moro, formerly a place of great strength, and commanding the channel to the port. It is now only used as a prison for political and military offenders and an occasional place for execution. Here, it was that the sentence of death on Lieutenant Gallios was carried out in May last. This officer had the charge of the small post with some 50 soldiers, and was unfortunate enough to be breakfasting in a cafe when the insurgents happened to pass. After disembarkation, they made their way to the Grand Hotel Inglaterra and met Alexander Golan the British Consul General, who had made all their arrangements. The next day, they would head out by train to visit Captain General Arsenio Martinez de Campos. But, as they were closer to the fighting now, their safety could not be guaranteed, which, of course, thrilled Winston. His next dispatch told of the train ahead of theirs carrying a Spanish general that had been forced off the track and several passengers had been seriously hurt. This made for good copy. 
After their train arrived safely, probably due to the Spanish general unknowingly taking the heat for them, they met Marshal Campos and received their passes. Now they just had to find the fighting. But again, as travel was not safe, they would have to take the long way around just to be safe to get to the more dangerous area. Or as Churchill put it, quote, though this route forms two sides of a triangle, it is, Euclid notwithstanding, shorter than the other, and we shall catch the column there, unquote. The Spanish column, their objective, was pursuing 4,000 rebels. By November 30th, they had caught up to General Juarez Valdez at the village of Aurora Blanco. At 5 a.m. that morning, Winston was walking with 1,700 men as they closed in on the rebel base. But suddenly, at 10 a.m., everyone stopped and lied down for the next four hours, except the sentries. Thus was Winston introduced to the siesta. This, like his cigars, would be incorporated into his life. Later, the Spanish column with Winston in tow continued on. But around 5 p.m., when they came upon the rebel camp, there were only signs of a hasty retreat. As it was late in the day, they bedded down for the night and arose again at 5 a.m. the next morning. The plan had been to have the main Spanish force move against the rebels with smaller forces on either side of it to protect its flanks. But, as Winston observed, the jungle did not allow this. Soon the Spanish army was a long, thin snake, winding its way through the bush. Winston was somewhere in the line, smoking a Cuban cigar. Later on in the day, when Winston was bathing in a nearby river, he and a few Spaniards heard shots nearby, and the whistle of bullets going over their heads. Winston wrote, quote, There is nothing more exhilarating than to be shot at without result, unquote. The siestas notwithstanding, the Spanish eventually caught up to the rebels, and the Battle of La Reforma took place the next morning. As the ground ahead cleared, General Valdez ordered his men into line. They walked toward the enemy's position, who started firing on them. The Spanish were taking losses, but the highly disciplined line held and continued to move forward. Soon, they were returning fire. Winston marveled at Valdez's courage. The commander did not carry a gun, and came within 50 yards of the enemy line, on his horse in his magnificent uniform. Of course, the rebels aimed for him, but only managed to take out his aides, who were riding nearby. The fighting continued, but the organized volleys from the Spanish soon started to pay off. The rifle shots from the Cubans slackened. Soon, they could be seen retreating into the thick jungle. As the Spanish only had rations for another day, they would have to return to base, allowing the rebels to live to fight another day. But it was declared a Spanish victory. Winston and Barnes observed all this, but never fired a shot. Still, they received the Red Cross a Spanish decoration for officers. Of course, they couldn't wear it back in Britain, as sympathy was against the Spanish, but it looked good on their blue and gold uniforms. The American newspapers would use this to say that the British officers, officially representing Britain, fought with the Spanish against the rebels. Winston would have to have a press conference, his first, when he returned to New York to deny this. Being young, he said things he should not have, but again, it was just a part of the overall adventure. They again boarded the Echuria and headed home. In looking at Winston's Cuban adventure, he showed himself to be brave. He could have stayed well back from the whizzing bullets, but did not, and he established himself as a respectable reporter. But the desire of Cuba to be free could not sink through his mind that liked the world just as it was. The idea that a former colony could make it on its own was preposterous to his way of thinking. Back at home, Winston was not looking forward to what loomed in his future, India. The idea bored him. The fourth was to be there for nine years, after all. 
but he did have six more months until the Hussars departed. And as it was the year of Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, there were parties, balls, and galas almost every night to attend. Jenny was back on the island, of course. She would not miss this. But it's worth noting that she had just left Burke Cochran in the Champs-Élysées apartment after a <clears throat> marathon visit. Perhaps meeting her son made Cochran miss his former lover. And India would not be nearly as boring as Winston thought it would be. His time to face death on the battlefield also loomed in his future. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment and thank a couple of people. Um, I have some new members, Zarek H., uh, Lorna C. from Upland, California, and Stephen L. from Griffin, Georgia. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank Stephen B. for buying a CD. And finally, I would like to thank Susan R. from Tasmania, Australia, and Malcolm B. from Gateshead, UK, for their donations. <laughs> 